If you are a dreamer, come in. If you are a dreamer, a wisher, a liar, a hoper, a prayer, a magic beach buyer, if you're a pretender, come sit by my fire, for we have some flax golden tails to spin. Come in, come in. Good evening, I'm Deborah Briggs, VP of Arts and Community at the Betsy Hotel. I open tonight with a poem by Shel Silverstein because it's National Poetry Month, a program launched by the Amer Academy of American Poets in 1996 to remind the public that poets have an integral role to play in our culture. I grew up the child of a poet and I learned early on that poetry matters. It's been my pleasure to spend the last 12 years in Miami embracing poets and their work, along with my family through our many programs at the Betsy, like the Betsy Writers Room, our residency program that has hosted a thousand visiting artists and the Betsy Poetry Rail, which champions the work of 12 writers that shaped Miami. So welcome all and thank you for allowing the Betsy to be part of this program. I'm delighted to be here with colleagues from the Wilsonian, the Jewish Museum of Florida and the Miami Beach Urban Studios. All three of tonight's partner institutions are FIU outposts located on Washington Avenue's cultural corridor. And this event is part of a standing series called On the Avenue. Though the Betsy's not quite on the avenue, we are close by located between Collins Ave and Ocean Drive between 14th and 15th streets. Pre-COVID, we all regularly convened face-to-face -face with our respective and shared audiences. Of course, we have plans to do the same post-COVID. However, while things are still reopening little by little, Zoom is a great and powerful way to come together. Our special thanks tonight goes to the city of Miami Beach, excuse me, the city of Miami Beach and Miami-Dade County Department of Cultural Affairs for supporting our respective and collective missions. It's this support that makes it possible to do what we do. So let's talk a bit about poetry now and set the stage for tonight. First, what is it? P. Scott Cunningham, poet, founder, and director of the region's storied poetry festival, Oh Miami, that makes its home at the Betsy, noted, definitions of poetry are almost as numerous as poems. John Keats used a lake metaphor. You don't dive into a lake to think about the lake. You dive in in order to feel the sensation of water. Understanding is neither essential to poetry, nor perhaps even preferred, and yet it's one of our most powerful tools for communicating personal experience. In fact, the word poetry comes from an ancient Greek word meaning to create or to make, suggesting the centrality of poetry to human creativity and expression. So here's what a few other poets said. Wordsworth said that poetry is the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings. T.S. Eliot said, genuine poetry can communicate before it is thoroughly understood. Allen Ginsberg, the beat poet said, poetry is the outlet for people to say in public what is only known in private. Rita Dove said, poetry is language at its most distilled and most powerful. Chaim Plutzik, my father said, poetry is the great synthesizer and humanizer of knowledge. And finally, Reginald Dwayne Betts, lawyer, poet, and poetry editor for the New York Times recently wrote, Poetry can serve as a measure by which readers can become acquainted with the difficulties and suffering of citizenship. Because such poems are born of a spirit of resistance and righteousness. They represent in literature the true spirit of what it means to be a true citizen. They can affirm founding values of freedom of speech and assembly in the promotion, pursuit, and expressions of a better tomorrow. In advancing a collective vision of what and who we each are and can be, poems can bear witness challenge assumptions and give substance to our most elemental ideals of justice. So now with a bit of shared background as context, each of our participating groups in this order, the Jewish Museum, the Wolfsonian, and then Miami Beach Urban Studios are going to make short presentations addressing poetry from their unique lens. With time limited, we know we'll just be touching the surface, but our goal is to leave you wanting more. Luckily, it's National Poetry Month and you will have many options to dig deeper in Miami and around the country. Speaking first tonight is, is Dr. Tudor Parfit, Academic Director of the Jewish Museum of Florida and President Yitzhak Navon, Professor of Sephardic Mizrahi Studies and Distinguished Professor at FIU in the Department of Religious Studies. 
Professor Parfit is a scholar and global traveler who studies Jewish communities around the world. And he'll speak tonight about Israeli poet Yehuda Amichai, whose work he has translated. Tudor. Good evening, everybody. Hebrew poetry, I never tire of telling my students, is the oldest continuous tradition of poetry writing in the, in the world. This evening, I shall read three poems from Yud Amichai, the greatest of the modern Hebrew poets. I got to know Yehuda when I was living in the old city of Jerusalem, and there was a group of us that knocked around together Ari Zaks, the poet, Moshe Savti, the architect, and his then girlfriend, Michael Ronen, Harold Schimmel, the translator and poet, and a few others. Yulda was already then <clears throat> world famous, and as the American critic uh, Robert Alter noted, was already the most translated Hebrew poet since King David. When I left Jerusalem finally to return to London, I started translating his works often with my friend and colleague, Glenda Abramson. One evening, the English poet, Ted Hughes, came to my place in London, St. John's Wood, for dinner, along with Yehuda, and we all puzzled over the translation of a word in the first poem I shall read, which is called, um, which is called Tourists. Yehuda at the time, <clears throat> when I was living in the old city, uh, he lived outside the walls uh, of the city in Mishkanot Shananim. And like me, he went to the Muslim quarter every day to do his uh, shopping. And um, as a result, he had to negotiate his way through hordes and hordes of, of tourists. So tourists. Visits of condolence is all we ever get from them. They squat at the Holocaust Memorial, they put on grave faces at the Wailing Wall, and they laugh behind heavy curtains in their hotels. They have their pictures taken together with our famous dead Rachel's tomb and Herzl's tomb, and on the top of Ammunition Hill, they weep over our sweet boys and lust over our tough girls and hang up their underwear to dry quickly in cool blue bathrooms. Once I sat on the steps by a gate at David's Tower. I placed my two heavy baskets at my side. A group of tourists were standing around their guide and I became their target marker. You see that man with the baskets just right of his head there's an arch from the Roman period, just right of his head, but he's moving, he's moving. I said to myself, redemption will come only if their guide tells them, you see that arch from the Roman period, it's not important, but next to it, left and down a bit, there sits a man who's bought fruit and vegetable for his family. Yoda was born in 1924. He died uh, in the year 2000. Um, as it happens, he was, um, he was born the same year as my mother who died uh, a few weeks ago. And I would like to dedicate uh, the translation of the next poem, Every Person is a Dam to my mother. Every person is a dam between the future and the past. And when we die, the dam bursts and the past flows into the future. And there is no before and there is no after. All time is one time like God Hear, O Israel, our time is one, and the dam 
becomes a blessed memory. One of Yulda's poems could easily have been written for our beautiful Jewish museum. It's so apposite that our director, Susan Gladstone Pasternak, and I had the idea of placing it somehow on a plaque in front of the museum on Washington Avenue. Sandra Seligman generously donated funds uh, to actually make this happen. And I would like to dedicate this translation of Poem Without End uh, to her. I'll read it first in, in Hebrew. Betoch Mosen Chadish Bet Knesset Yashan. Betoch Bet Knesset Ani. Betochi Libi. Betoch Libi Moseon. Betoch Moseon Bet Knesset. Betochu Ani. Betochi Libi. Betoch Libi Moseon. Poem without end. Within the new museum is an old synagogue. Within the synagogue is me. Within me is my heart. Within my heart is a museum. Within the museum, a synagogue. Within it, me. Within me, my heart. Within my heart, a museum. Thank you. Thank you, Tudor, for sharing your translation of Yehuda, Yehuda Amichai's work. Thank you also for opening with a poem called Tourist. To us in Miami, that is just perfect. And uh, what a beautiful sentiment it offered about what's most important in life. And thank you also for dedicating a poem to your mother. May her memory be a blessing. Our next speaker is Howard Kamner. Howard is the author of the acclaimed autobiography, Turbulence at 67 Inches. He's written 21 books of poetry, including the Pulitzer Prize nominated Poems from the Mud Room. He's a past Miami New Times best poet in Miami and received the Albert Nelson Marquis Lifetime Achievement Award in 2018. Howard will be reading from a collection called Poems from the Mudroom. It's exciting to have a live poet reading tonight and one that has made Miami his home for so many years. Howard? Okay. All right, can you hear me now? Okay, all right. All right, this is called The Amazing Shem Guards Traveling Flea Circus, circa 1962. I stood on my toes and peered into the miniature big top and there they were fleas. Fleas walking the tightrope with no net below, fleas jumping through hoops. Fleas shot out of cannons, fleas on the flying trapeze. Chinese acrobat fleas, 10 flea clowns in a tiny flea car. Swords following fleas, fleas that juggle, fire eating fleas, incredible, amazing fleas. And as others walked down in disgust, having not seen a thing, the amazing Shem guard ringmaster and proprietor of the flea circus tried to make a believer out of me. He said, if you look real hard, you can see them, kid. I do see them. I said, they're amazing. Shemgar just laughed. He said, there's nothing to see, kid. It's all mechanical. Then he showed me the hidden buttons he presses to make everything work. He put a tiny bicycle on a tightrope and he pressed a button and it pedaled back and forth. You see, kid, he said, it's all just an illusion. No, Mr. Shemgar, I said, no, the fleas are there. You're an illusion.
This is called Broad on the Beach, a very romantic poem. She's a trap. I can sense it. She doesn't move except to turn the pages of a romance. I circle her and imagine, but that's as far as I'll go because she's dangerous. I can feel it. Her glance is casual. Her beauty is overwhelming. And just as I'm about to give in, her dark glasses slip down the bridge of her nose and she pushes them back up with her tongue. That's a true story. This one's called Generations. My biggest fear then was that my parents would never get to see me grow up. But times change, years pass. And my biggest fear now is that my children may never get to see me grow up. This one's called Kismet. She wanted to be a ballerina, but she had webbed toes, so she became a mermaid instead. All day long, she would sit on a rock by the sea, comb her hair, sing sweetly and devour men. Though she never could perform an open sasana birthday posing at a 90 degree arabesque angle, flying to the side like in the classical ballet, the idiot, but she could bite a man's head off. And in my book, that's more impressive. This is Mad Mildred, a liberated woman. She rocks back and forth in her rocking chair, singing an old lullaby and knitting mittens for the kids down the street. Across the room, sitting at the dinner table, is the skeleton of her husband, Frank, and the bones of their dog at his feet. Frank's skeleton has a pipe in his mouth and is reading a 40-year-old newspaper. The dog's just dead. Mildred, hated them both. One day she went insane and just stopped feeding them. This is my mentor. My mentor sits staring at a giant painting of a blank face. It's just this blank face with no eyes, no ears, no nose, no mouth, nothing, just a a big blank face. My mentor stares at it all day and all night. I visit him once a week for inspiration. He never looks at me, he just keeps staring at that big painting of that big giant blank face and imparts his wisdom. He says the nail, the nail which holds this painting up on the wall never gets a moment's rest. Don't be a nail. The madman of mime, pacing the floor of the raging sea. The madman of mime waits for a lady who will never arrive. Gambling on the hereafter, he lets this life slip away without a second thought. Playing the fool for no reward, the madman of mime makes it up as he goes along. He writes himself love letters that he never reads and he gets his gold from stolen fables. Washing his hands of the whole affair, the madman of mime tries to forget how he lost his mind. On a sunken ship, he marks a deck and cheats his way through solitaire. It's a critical struggle with a cynical view, and it's done with a flick of the wrist. A 
If the madman of mime knows not to cry, you can't carry a torch under water. This is owed to Mother Earth. When the old man hit the road, she was left to raise us alone. She did what she could, but it wasn't good enough. We still became ungrateful bastards. We trampled her soul, pierced her heart and poisoned her waters. We cut her into pieces and sold her out. We dumped at her door, set fire to her crown and raped her flesh. She offered her milk and we sucked the life out of her. She gave us beauty and we murdered it. We murdered it. That is what we do. We are human. We caught it in our sights and pulled the trigger and chopped its head off and hung it on the wall. We're proud of our sickness. We brag about it. We celebrate our disease. We are human. And Mother Earth, Mother Earth, she takes it all in stride, knowing that the time will come when we'll all return home to her looking for sympathy. And she'll put us to bed and cover us up and grind our bones into dust. I am a stick man. You could look at me forever and never see me for who I am. I move through landscapes unnoticed, wanting everything I see. To you, I am the sum of a few lines drawn in tattered and nothing more. But I bleed and cry and love as much as anyone. I am a stick man, but don't think less of me. That would be ignorance and ignorance is a mistake. I can fit into scenes where you can't. I can blend into architecture and never lose my way. I can form opinions and doorways just by switching positions. In one move, I can change my image and give myself some hope. This one is sort of my signature poem. This is called Zoot Suit. To my recollection, we never played catch. He never took me camping. He never took me fishing. He never taught me how to play chess. Hell, we never even went to the zoo. But we did go to a lot of freak shows together, freak shows. Me and my baseball cap and him in that lime green zoot suit, that lime green zoot suit. He loved that zoot suit. We went to freak shows all the time. We'd gawk into pinheads. We glanced into hideously deformed snake man. We cringed as the geek bit off the head of a live chicken for a bottle of booze. We'd watch in amazement as the limbless hot dog man would roll a cigarette with his mouth and light it with his tongue. We gasped at the man with the bottom half of his writhing twin sticking out of his chest. We'd stare at the repulsive dog-faced girl, the monstrous pig boy, horror upon horror. But it was meant to teach me a lesson. When we would leave the freak shows, my father would put his arm around me and say, son, as you go through life and you think you have problems, just remember these poor bastards and their problems. And I thought to myself, yeah, they got problems, real problems, but at least they don't have to be seen in public with a guy in a lime green zoot suit. Thank you, Howard, for sharing your work.
your poetry um, reminded us about the passage of time and how some things never change, yet they always change. They're constantly changing. In fact, that's the only thing that's certain. I'm delighted now to introduce two faculty members from the Department of English at FIU, Professors Nathaniel Cadle and Sean Christian. Nathaniel Cadle is an associate professor of English where he teaches at FIU, where he teaches and writes about 19th and 20th century American literature. Dr. Cadle is the author of The Meditating Nation, Late American Realism, Globalization, and the Progressive State, published in 2014. Sean Anthony Christian is Associate Professor of English where he teaches uh, and writes on African-American literary and print culture. He's the author of The Harlem Renaissance and Idea of a Negro Reader, 2016. Professors Cadle and Christian are working with, with the Wolfsonian on an exhibition about the Harlem Renaissance, a period in which African-American artists reclaimed their identity and racial pride in defiance of widespread prejudice and discrimination. Poetry from the Harlem Renaissance reflected a diversity of forms and subjects and included the work from poets like Claude McKay, Georgia Douglas Johnson and Langston Hughes. As part of this presentation tonight, I'm excited that we're going to hear Langston Hughes read in an archival recording. Thank you, Deborah. Um, so as Deborah said, we're um, in a sense giving you a preview of an exhibition that will be available online, uh, Google Arts and Culture, hopefully within the next month or so, or, or we're still finalizing the timeline. Um, but what the exhibition is designed to do is to uh, explore the material and print culture of the Harlem Renaissance. It's brought about by a generous donation from Daniel Morris, uh, several dozen uh, pieces, books, magazines, uh, sheet music, photographs, and so forth. And what these, uh, these items do is they display an insight, not just into the poetry itself, uh, which is what we'll be highlighting here, but also the collaboration that took place between the writers and the artists. Um, and what uh, Sean and I have been working with, I'm going to read a short um, quotation from the painter and illustrator Aaron Douglas in a letter that he wrote to Langston Hughes in 1925, which I think kind of picks up on these ideas of collaboration and the, the sheer materiality of what the Harlem Renaissance was, was trying to do. Let's bear our arms and plunge them deep through laughter, through pain, through sorrow, through hope, through disappointment, into the very depths of the souls of our people and drag forth material crude. Then let's sing it, dance it, write it, paint it. Let's create something transcendently material, material uh, mystically objective. So what you're seeing now, we'll, we'll look at about four slides. Um, the first one, I'll talk about the first two and then my colleague Sean will take over the next two. The first one is uh, one of the early texts of the Harlem Renaissance. It's a collection of poetry by County Cullen called Color. And it's a good example of the collaboration between County Cullen and the artist Charles Cullen, who by the way, was not related to County Cullen. Um, but you even get a sense of this in the, the shared credit on, the, on the, the cover of the book there. If you see on the screen on the right, uh, hand, the, the, sorry, the left-hand side, um, both County and Charles Cullen's names are listed there. Um, what I've included on the right-hand side is Cullen's poem Tableau, which is one of his most widely anthologized, which also has an illustration. Um, the, tab, the, the poem Tableau, I, I won't read, um, but it discusses um, the, the racial comedy in many ways. And this is reflected in the art the illustration at the bottom. Um, the other thing that I'll mention about this particular illustration is it also gives us a sense of the sheer variety of uh, visual styles that the Harlem Renaissance involved. Um, one of the things that Sean and I were discussing about this particular image is that it's quite different from some of the images that you'll see that Aaron Douglas painted in a couple of slides. Um, the very sleek lines of the, of the figures um, is in some ways, I think, uh, a, indebted to the Art Nouveau movement of the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and this is actually quite different from the style, visual style that you'll see Aaron Douglas engaged in. 
The next image is a poetry spread, and this is from the, the Crisis Magazine, the uh, publication of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP. This is from the April 1927 issue. Uh, incidentally, just after uh, Jesse Fawcett, who was the literary editor of the magazine, left, this may have actually been one of the last poetry spreads that she was involved in organizing. Um, a good example, I think, of the way that poetry um, in the Harlem Renaissance was pervading um, the lives of people who were subscribed to the crisis. The crisis is a magazine that did many things. It talked about political situations in the United States, globally. Um, there were society pages talking about the accomplishments and achievements of the members of the NAACP. Um, and in the middle of this, uh, right in, literally, quite, quite literally in the middle of this magazine, this particular issue, is this poetry spread. Uh, on the left-hand side, you see multiple poems, including one by uh, Arna Bontemps, whose photograph that is uh, in the middle column. Um, Sterling Brown is represented here as well. Um, these are not names that are probably as well known as County Cullen or Langston Hughes, um, but it also they were they were significant figures, significant poets at the time, and also give us a sense of uh, the sheer scale of the Harlem Renaissance. It wasn't just Langston Hughes all the time. There were a lot of uh, participants. On the right hand side, um, you'll see this poem "Wishes" by Georgia Douglas Johnson. And what's notable about this, again, I think, is the relationship between the, artist, the artistic effort and the literary effort. Um, so in the middle of this poem, like literally disrupting the poem, is this, uh, this drawing by Laura Wheeler. Um, yeah, so the only thing I guess that I'll, I'll say, I'll turn it over to Sean now, is just to keep in mind this idea of uh, the marriage between the, the literary arts and the visual, and in some cases, the performing arts. Great, great. Thank you, Nathaniel. Um, I'll begin by just adding the point too, that um, we have this treasure trove uh, from Daniel Morris, in part because uh, many of the cultural promoters, writers themselves, uh, people like Elaine Locke, who edited the uh, important anthology, The New Negro, saw it as an opportunity, the period as an opportunity to really document uh, what was happening uh, in the 1920s and early 1930s. Um, and so publishers were uh, attuned to the you know, possibilities uh, that this kind of cultural flowering uh, of art, literature, and music uh, really meant for the United States at the time and even uh, internationally. And so these important uh, publications and works that we have before us persisted in part because lots of people saw this as a viable way to kind of mark uh, the moment. Here we have images from James Weldon Johnson's uh, volume, God's Trombones. Johnson, as some of you might know, uh, was an important uh, poet himself and a critic, um, a lawyer for the NAACP, its secretary at one point, and as I like to often refer to him, a Florida boy. Uh, because he uh, spent some time uh, here uh, in the great state of Florida. <clears throat> God's Trombones is uh, in, subtitled Seven Negro Sermons in Verse and really does capture the power and dynamism of Black uh, folk speech, especially uh, that which came from Black, preacher, black, black preachers in the South, uh, particularly around their uh, imagery and metaphorical uh, play. <clears throat> but in it, you, you find uh, Johnson has really tapped into uh, the poetry and the artistry in Black religious and spiritual expression. Uh, for example, the off perform the creation is one that many young people recite as a part of their church pageants or oratorical contests. Uh, the cover and inside images displayed here also remind us of the collaborations that Nathaniel mentioned that fuel the period between artists, in this case, between Johnson and painter and graphic artist Aaron Douglas, uh, and also between literature, the visual, and the performing arts. The through line, though, is always how life uh, was lived by Black people during the period. Celebrated as the poet laureate of the, new, uh, the Negro people, Langston Hughes' first volume of poetry, Weary Blues, is our next image. <clears throat> and here again, you have word and image uh, coming together and offering us one of the most storied volumes of the Harlem Renaissance. Uh, as poetry, visual art, and performance, the Weary Blues celebrates folk expression, but this time in the forms of the blues and jazz, which Aaron Douglas's cover 
images so powerfully. Hughes's volume displays human pains and joys personalized through black experience, but resonant for anyone. The volume has so many themes related to the history and realities of black America th that the commanding voices in each poem speak as though historians or griots. Uh, one of his most famous poems, The Negro Speaks of Rivers, exemplifies Hughes's abilities in this regard. Since it is National Poetry Month, Nathaniel and I thought it was important to conclude our contribution today by sharing this reading, uh, recording, I should say, of Langston Hughes's reciting his title poem, Weary Blues. Thank you. I'm gonna sing. Sun's a setting. This is what I'm gonna sing. I feel the blues are coming. I wonder what the blues will bring. Thank you, Nathaniel and Sean, for giving us a heads up on the fantastic exhibition that's coming up the, at the Wilsonian. It's powerful to see the relevancy and community-oriented nature of FIU scholarship and programming. And so thank you in particular for reminding us about the power of poetic voices from the Harlem Renaissance and that uh, Langston Hughes is just one of many of those important voices. Thank you for uh, sharing that. Your work makes a difference. Multimedia artist Chris Friday is next tonight, and she is representing FIU Miami Beach Urban Studios. 
She has a BFA in drawing from the New World School for the Arts and an MFA from FIU. Chris Friday likes to let her work speak for itself. And with her emphasis on text-based art, it generally does this quite literally. But even with that said, it's good to have her here with us to help us read between the lines. Chris, please join us. Thank you for that introduction, Deborah. I'm honored to be a part of this presentation tonight, so thank you for having me. Um, let me share my screen. Can you see? Sorry, excuse me. Uh oh, excuse me. I'm sorry, it started at the end. Okay, here we go. Okay. So hello everyone. Again, I'm Chris Friday. And um, I really love this topic, Words Matter, because I am an artist um, with a practice that very much focuses on the importance of words. And that's in whatever configuration that they come in. So whether that's in the form of poetry, song lyrics, which I do consider to be a form of poetry, or simply words and texts pulled from media and pop culture. Um, I'm interested in the power of words and how from a very early age, they help to shape our perceptions of ourselves and others in the world around us. So um, tonight I'll just be showing a small selection of my works, um, some old, some new, um, but all deal directly with text and what I feel is you know, um, the power of words. So the first slide. is um, The Art of Arting by, as Taught by the Institution. That's the title of this work. And it's a pretty simple concept. It's a text-based collection of 20 plus contradictory statements made by professors in undergrad um, and attempts to teach me what art was or wasn't. And so these statements like um, art can mean nothing, art must mean something, when displayed, they're always paired in twos to solicit the effect of like one statement immediately canceling the other out. And I wanted to reflect what I was learning at that time um, because it was just a lot of bias and personal preference about what you know, each individual thought art was. And if that was the case, you know, art I realized could be whatever I needed or wanted it to be, not just what I was being told. And so that kind of set me down the path of questioning just what I was allowing myself to be taught, not just in the classroom, but in the world around me. So from that point on, my visual language um, kind of took on uh, this blackboard and chalk aesthetic to kind of play with that idea of learning and being taught. And I started to investigate the concept of words and kind of taking a deconstructionist approach to how meaning is created, altered or destroyed using words. So in the work Meaningful, for example, which is the work on the right hand side of the screen, um, I asked visitors uh, who came to my studio to write down a word that meant something to them on a strip of paper. And then when they gave it to me, I would just toss it on the floor to be lost among the hundreds of other words that were already there. And it kind of rendered that word meaningless, but only momentarily because when other visitors came in, they found incidental relationships and created meaning through free association which like gave the words a life and power of their own based on each individual and their prior experiences. And that was like super interesting to me. And so later I would take these same words, you know, from the floor and I'd add them to other works like you see on the left side of the screen, which is untitled. And I did that to alter the statement and, you know, deepen the meaning behind the work, giving it an extra like little layer of conceptual razzle dazzle. And for me, it just kind of solidified in a very simple way that, you know, words are indeed a very powerful conceptual tool and one that I would definitely like continue using how I want it to in my work. And, you know, it's not new information that words are powerful. We know about propaganda and the power of subversion and repetition of simple words and phrases and the psychological effects that that can have historically. And yet as a country, I feel sometimes we simultaneously deny that those same elements that were in, uh, in play back then are at play in modern society, especially when it comes to the effects of words on the perceptions of brown and black bodies. So from there, I begin to wonder, 
you know, what words were influencing my own perceptions of myself, my own black body, and, you know, how were words influencing, you know, how others saw me. And so I found those answers in mainstream media, the internet and pop culture, print media, film, television, the internet, advertising, and marketing, like all of it is teaching us something. And so I began to investigate it all, you know, for, for the messaging that it was, it was sending. Um, so when I was a little girl, a now iconic kind of hair relaxer brand targeted little black girls and their mom and advertised that it would leave our hair soft and beautiful. And in fact, if you can see the right side of the screen, the name of the company that created the relaxer was called Soft and Beautiful. Um, and ironically, that Just For Me relaxer was you know, specifically for a type of hair that was the opposite of soft and beautiful, right? And so that constant like kind of messaging via television and radio, um, job postings and being told, you know, that your hair is not beautiful or it's unprofessional the way that it grows out of your scalp. Um, and the solution to that is to like chemically damage your hair beyond repair in order to assimilate to arbitrary standards of beauty. And words are indeed so powerful that an advertisement like that, which came with its own theme song, by the way, it came with a song, um, was literally like emotional terrorism on our self-esteem from very, very young ages. And so works like Subjective Portrait, which is on the left, it shows a young black girl with the text from that logo imposing itself and obscuring the body and like the perception of the body, forcing little black girls to view themselves and their bodies and their features through this kind of colonized lens. In the miseducation of Chris Friday, this work was um, for me kind of an exercise in mimicking that kind of subversion of problematic information that the media often slips into what we ingest. And even though um, in this work, I littered it with contradictions, specific references to domestic violence, rape, colorism, sexism, and sexual imagery, the work only received positive responses from viewers. People would get down and pose with it and, oh, it's Nicki Minaj. And, you know, they had a blast with it. But it was just the commentary about like that kind of constructed palatability of media and how we as in humans will literally accept almost anything information wise if it comes with beautiful visuals, striking imagery, witty one liners and in the case of music, like if the beat slaps. And this is particularly why um, hip hop and rap music. Um, and the powerful influence that it has on popular culture are like not only things that I investigate for its messaging, but I tend to use them as a sort of universal language in my work because of their global appeal. So in keeping with tonight's theme, I'd like to talk briefly about the following two works and how I use music, um, specifically, you know, rap, which to me is just poetry in its most powerful and influential form to help relay uh, community specific issues to a broader audience. As is the case right here with this work, um, which is called National Pizza Week. And it was a, a projection series done in um, the area called Ghouls, Florida, which is where I live. And in this work, I took song lyrics from the song Deliver by rapper Lupe, Lupe Fiasco. And in that song, it describes the kind of stereotypes that persist through time to work and demonize and simultaneously justify the discrimination of entire populations, restricting access to basic luxuries such as healthy grocery stores and, and, and pizza being delivered to those communities. So the work takes the lyrics like um, pizza man don't come here no more and projects them onto the very spaces that are suffering as a direct result of the perceptions about those areas and the type of people who inhabit them. Perceptions that can be perpetuated through media and the internet by words and phrases like black on black crime, thugs and dangerous being used as descript you know, you know dis, uh, descriptive words for these neighborhoods and the groups that occupy those spaces. And like I said, I live there. So that that is particularly concerning for me. Words do matter. And if I could leave a thought with you tonight, it would be to be careful of the way you identify and describe others and the way you allow yourself to be described and what words you choose to answer to. So um, as an artist, I'm very fortunate uh, to have multiple modes of expression. So not only do I use lyrics written by other artists, but I also write and use my own songs in my work as well. So before I close, I'd like to show a video. 
And the video is entitled Frolic. And it's really um, an investigation into the way our perceptions can be easily manipulated when the right elements are at play. So of course I use the visual elements like color and specific clips from home video footage. But for me, the real influencing power in this video is like that intentional somber um, lyrics and music that primes the viewer's perception. And it's kind of like those Sarah McLaughlin um, pet rescue commercials that made you feel really bad and out about not donating 80 cents a day. Like I, I do the same thing here and I use words to prime the viewer to lead you to view what's happening in a very specific way. And as a result, the innocent playfulness of young siblings who are my daughters, by the way, they under, it undergoes significant contextual changes, allowing for individuals to imagine like both disturbing and empowering narratives. So I'll play this video and then afterwards I'll turn it back over into the hands of our lovely moderator. We're so young, inexperienced. We don't know how to love, we don't know how to love, but we're having so much fun, learning how to run, but when it's said and done, we'll be raisins in the sun. Do we ever get the things we want? What do we want? Games are only fun if you're the one who's playing games. Games are only fun if you're the one who's playing games. Games are only fun if you're the one who gets to play. Play so well, so show me how it's done. Then I'll show someone Is this how we love? How can this be love? If you've already won When's enough enough? I don't wanna play these games I don't wanna play these games Games are only fun if you're the one who's playing games Games are only fun if you're the one who's playing games. Games are only fun if you're the one who gets to play. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Chris. Your voice is so powerful and your interdisciplinary approach is, is uh, intentional and intelligent and so effective. Thank you, thank you. So uh, we're coming to an end tonight. What uh, such a collection of powerful presentations. Uh, I wanted a moment to share before we close. I mentioned earlier tonight that my own father, Chaim Plutzik, was a poet. 
Those that have come to the Betsy know that we honor his legacy in a variety of ways. Born to immigrant parents, he did not speak English till he was seven years old. After serving in World War II, he went on to become a university professor and a three-time Pulitzer Prize finalist. We're proud to announce that in partnership with Miami-based Suburbano Ediciones, his work will be brought to Spanish audiences for the first time in a collection of selected poems called 32 Poems, 32 Poemas, with a foreword by Obama inaugural poet Richard Blanco. To close the program tonight, one of the translators, Miami-based writer Pablo Gartaya, will now present a reading of On Hearing That My Poems Were Studied in a Distant Place. He'll read in both English and Spanish. The closing lines of this poem are the alpha and the omega of the Betsy poetry rail. And they aptly summarize the experience of poets and all artists when they put their work out into the world. Out of my life, I fashioned a fistful of words. When I opened my hands, they flew away. Now we'll see the video, the reading. Greetings, Greetings. my name my is Pablo Cartaya and I am an author. And here's a poem I translated for a new publication called 32 Poems, 32 Poemas of Heim Plutzig. The poem that I will be reading, the one that I translated, is called On Hearing That My Poems Were Being Studied in a Distant Place. Al escuchar que mis poemas fueron estudiados en un lugar lejano. On hearing that my poems were being studied in a distant place. What are they mumbling about me there? Here, they say, he suffered. Here, he was glad. Are words clothes or the putting off of clothes? The scene is as follows. My book is open. On 30 desks, the teacher expounds my life. Outside the window, the Pacific roars like a lion, beside which my small words rise and fall. In this alliteration, a tower crashed. Our words clothes or the putting off of clothes. Here, in the fisherman casting on the water, he saw the end of the dreamer, and in that image, death naked. Out of my life, I fashioned a fistful of words. When I opened my hand, they flew away. Al escuchar que mis poemas fueron estudiados en un lugar lejano. Y allá, ¿qué murmuran sobre mí? Aquí, dicen, él sufrió, aquí estaba alegre. ¿Son ropa las palabras o son el desnudarse con ellas? La escena es la siguiente. Mi libro está abierto. En presencia de 30 pupitres, el maestro expone mi vida. Fuera de la ventana, el pacífico ruge como un león. A lo largo de ese pacífico, mis pequeñas palabras suben y bajan. En esta aliteración se estrelló una torre. ¿Son ropa las palabras o son el desnudarse con ellas? Aquí, en el pescador que lanza sobre el agua, vio el fin del soñador y en esa imagen la muerte desnuda. De mi vida he creado un puñado de palabras y cuando abrí la mano salieron volando. Thank you to Pablo Cartaya for sharing the poem with us. In closing, I wanted to share that the Academy of American Poets website quotes Mark Doty as follows. The project of poetry in a way is to raise language to such a level that it can convey the precise nature of subjective experience. That the listener would envision not just a mouse, for example, but this particular mouse in all of its exact specificity, its perfect details, 
Such enchanted language could magically dissolve the separateness between us and render perception so evocatively that we don't just know what it means, we, we feel what it means. And because the most important lesson of all is that great art and poetry can live on forever, I want to leave you with this poem by Rumi, a 13th century poet and mystic. It's an invitation to all of us to speak up and speak out. Raise your words, not your voice. It is rain that grows flowers, not thunder. So what a night to honor National Poetry Month. Together we've celebrated the global work and commentaries of Yehuda Amichai, Reginald Dwayne Betts, Word Wordsworth, Langston Hughes, T.S. Eliot, Pablo Cartaya, P. Scott Cunningham, Allen Ginsberg, Rita Dove, Howard Kamner, Chaim Plutzik, Chris Friday, Mark Doty, Rumi, and last but not least, and first tonight, Shel Silverstein. Thank you all for coming. Watch your emails for announcements on the next iteration of On the Avenue. Words matter. Happy National Poetry Month and have a great evening. Good night.